question. Uh, we know what's wrong, but what does right look like? This last fall marked the beginning of Living One's fourth year, but today these conversations are more important than ever. They are more than conversations. They are opportunities to build community, solve for the isolating wounds of our time. Today, we have the first session of our winter series, Animal Trauma Responsive Care and Alternative Medicine. Continuing over the next six weeks, we will hear the perspectives of six individuals who've dedicated their lives to animal psychological and physical healing as they share their experiences and the transformative nature of this work. We are delighted to have you join us as we explore this important topic together. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are all currently on in various different indigenous lands. I am currently on the ancestral homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, which includes the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. This land exists also as a place of trade with other indigenous communities, including the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Menominee, Sauk, and Meskwaki. The Krulo Center for Nonviolence, located in Southern Oregon, is also the homelands of the Grizzly Bear, Tekelma, and Gray Wolf. To recognize the land is to recognize the lasting effects of colonization, genocide, and oppression that still impact indigenous communities today, but it is also an expression of gratitude and appreciation for the land and for all those whose homelands we live and work on. In the first of this six-part series, we welcome Mr. Ray Ryan, Born and raised in Chicago, Ray moved west to California after graduating from high school. He got his first formal job working with animals when he was hired by Pat Derby, founder of the Performing Animal Welfare Society, where he was caregiver with rescued wolves, bears, leopards, and tigers. It was here that Ray met an elephant for the first time. Eventually, he moved to San Diego to obtain a BS degree in counseling psychology at San Diego State University. During his tenure at San Diego State, he was employed as a caregiver for both male and female Barbary apes used in the study of primate perceptual and analytical skills. After completing his bachelor's degree, Ray applied for a local job caring for gorillas and orangutans at the Wild Animal Park. He was instead offered a position caring for a group of African elephants and later Asian elephants. This experience was to change his life forever profoundly affected by the violence and abuse that elephants and other animals suffer in the captive trade, Ray quit the zoo and wrote his celebrated book, Keepers of the Ark, An Elephant's View of Captivity. Its second edition is soon to be released. Ray's unique experiences and expertise continue to be called upon for legal cases, lectures, interviews, and document documentaries in aid of captive held elephants. Before we begin, let me share a few logistical notes. Ray will be speaking for about 45 minutes, after which we will have 15 minutes for question and answer. In order to proceed in a timely manner, we ask that you please send your questions along in the chat during Ray's presentation, and then we will read them out after he's finished speaking. Also, please note that this Zoom session will be recorded, so if you would feel more comfortable leaving your camera off or changing your Zoom name, please feel free to do so. Finally, we ask that unless you are currently speaking, you keep your microphone muted to avoid any unintended interruptions. So without further ado, we welcome Mr. Ray Ryan. Welcome, Ray. We're so glad to have you. Hi, thanks. That sounded like a great eulogy. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so just to start off, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your arc, how you came to do this work? Well, I basically back into working with elephants. That's... Uh, it was an awakening. It was an epiphany, but I needed a job. And I was told that I had a job working with the gorillas and the orangutans. And uh, because we were union, they had to post the job. So somebody that had studied baboons in Africa got the job, mm -hmm. but he had been taking care of the African elephants. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I really needed a job. So I applied for it. And as a result of the guy that was going to be my initial supervisor, he grew up in, in New York in the Bronx and I grew up in Chicago. We just kind of hit it off. And uh, boom, one day on the job, walked in there and, uh, you know, starry eyed, you know, I'm walking in. It, so everyone understands the elephant barn at that time was only one barn and it was the size of a big rectangle. So you walked in the main door and they had three stalls with two Asian elephants in each one of them. And then on the main floor was the African elephants. So you had to go through the Asians to get to the Africans. And so I followed everybody because I'm first day on the job. And honest to God, truth, a wake up call. I'm standing there, scared, starry eyed. And all of a sudden, a trunk went around my neck and tried to pull me into the back stall. And 
basically to take me out. And, uh, and it was Cindy, who, as everyone that's ever been around elephants know how famous she is. And she had only been there for a few months before I got there. And she hated everybody. And she had been so abused, I found out later. You know, she had been beaten and severely and juiced. And so everybody knows what juiced is. It's when you take an elephant and you hose them down and you stick an electrical cord up their butt and you flick on the switch. So she had been lobotomized and full bodied, but I didn't know that then. So I'm still scared. So everything went on and, you know, I had to go in the side door from that point on. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe that's, everyone tells you when you start that they're, they're going to kill you. They tell you they're mean and they're violent. They actually tell you that when you start. So you come in with a different concept. And I didn't want to believe it and I didn't want to go along with it. And about well, a week and a half later, I was, we would bring the Africans in every, every day to clean them and hose them. And Peach, who was the boss, uh, I was told she's getting irritated by you because I was insulting her by emptying out her bucket of food while we brought him in to hose him down. Mm. And everyone said, she's going to get you. She's going to get you. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, just, you know, they're nice and cuddly. And, and I walked behind her one day and she lifted her back leg and hit me and kicked me into a wall and missed my head by about three inches. And that's how close and you know, how exact she was. She was just waking me up. You know, it was like, I'm the boss. <laughs> You're taking care of me. Wake up and give me respect. And then, which was the hardest thing that I ever had to do, is Rue Croft came and Lou, who was my immediate supervisor, and Pat Humphrey, who was basically taking care of the Asians, said, You're going to have to beat her. And I said, What do you mean I'm going to have to beat her? They didn't mean hit her. They meant beat her. And I said, well, I can't do that. They said, well, then you're fired today. This is your last day on the job. And uh, that was hard. It was hard to do it. But once you do that, and I don't know where that comes from, and uh, it releases something in you mm -hmm. that gives you permission. And it's weird because if you don't do it, they it just you had to do it. That's how it was always done. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing, and this was the first introduction to me, how intelligent and how nice they were, is that I did. It went on for like a half an hour, and I had, you know, with, you know, you have an elephant hook, basically. And you hit them in their knuckles, and you hit them in their head, you hit them in the side of their head, you hit them in their face. And, and then, get this, which was really interesting. And then 20 minutes later, you're actually out in the yard picking up their poop. And you can feel her looking over my shoulder. She was off chains then. And she, you know what she was saying. She was going, do you know what you just did to me? <laughs> and you know that I'm three tons and I can run 30 miles an hour. Do you know what you just did to me? And I'm going to let you go. Mm. And it, it went on for months. And, and eventually she just gave up one day. It was almost like, all right, you know, he passed the test. And there was a lot of tension for at least easily for at least a full, full, probably a full year working there. Because unbeknownst to a lot of people, all the elephants don't like each other and they don't all get along with each other. And we're working with one group in a barn overnight that was from Asia or Thailand, whatever. And then you had the African elephants and there was just this tension that went on. And eventually it took some time to build an Asian barn. And their excuse was they were going to use it for a breeding center. But what one of the big impetuses, one of the big pushes they did to get it going is there was eight Asian elephants and they could only put six in our barn. So two of them were chained overnight under like a rock structure in the Asian yard. It was covered. It looked like Stonehenge. But what was happening overnight is the rats were sneaking in and eating their feet. They were actually chewing on the elephant's feet. And so, you know, word gets around really quickly that, you know, so that was a push to get them their own barn. And then once they were gone, and we only had the Africans, and it changed everything. It changed the dynamics. It changed how you work with them. But they were still beating them. They were still hitting them all the time. And I was too. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I didn't do it. And it's always out of fear. Because you're told that they're mean and they're killers, which they're not. But that's what you're told. So you go in with a mindset that you got to act tougher than they do. Does that make sense? You know, mm -hmm. we're going to show them, even though they're, you know, 10 feet tall sometimes. <laughs> but I used to go, and uh, I'll give Steve Friedland a lot of credit, good mm -hmm. friend of mine still. He was in charge of all the elephants down at the zoo. 
and he had worked with the Africans initially when they, you know, started working with them. And I used to go down there because I only lived 10 minutes from the zoo. And I would go down there and I, first thing out of my mouth, and I didn't even know, I said, why are we hitting them? Why are we beating them? And I don't mean hitting them, I mean beating them. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. When you have an animal on chains laying down and you're whacking the crap out of them. And uh, just because you can. And he would say, you don't have to. You don't have to, you don't have to. And it took some time to convince Lou that we didn't have to hit him because he had been around the Asians all the time and then went up with the Africans. So, you, you know, you bring that with you. You know, it's like you bring your AK-47 when you move to a different neighborhood. And he was beating them all the time. We kept, you know, why don't we, why don't we just try not doing that? And it took, it took a long time. It just did maybe Steve talking to him, maybe his wife talking to him. She was very, very, very spiritual and passive person saying, why don't we just try not hitting them? Let's give it a shot. And as that happened and at that time went on, the level of tension just dissipated. It really got so easy going because we didn't ask them to do rides. We didn't ask them to do shows. And Lou, you know, you get bored when you're taking care of elephants because once you clean, unless you're doing rides and shows, I have to throw that in there, you have nothing else to do but hang out with them and learn to watch them and listen to them. But when you have to do rides and you have to do shows, it breaks up your day. And so, and Lou was still doing that. Listen, I would, I remember I got pictures of me sitting on Sabu's head for no other reason except we could do it, you know? And then you eventually go, why are we doing all this stuff? Why are we doing all this stuff? And they, it's weird to say, unless you've been around them, they would give you that look like, okay. Because the bug eyed look on their faces when we used to bring them in, knowing that one of them or all of them eventually was going to get hit that day because they weren't walking fast enough or they didn't back up fast enough. You know what I mean? Certain things that we put parameters on them as opposed to finally realizing we're just taking care of them. We basically were really, we weren't trainers, even though they classify you as a trainer. Mm -hmm. We're just keepers. We're just hanging out with them. And we were lucky. I was lucky because in a lot of zoos, they, it's basically called strings. You'll take care of the elephants. Then you go take care of Ryan. And then you can take care of, you know, you do like four or five animals a day because after 10 o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning, we're done cleaning the barn. You really have nothing else to do but hang out with them. But you got to know them. You know what I mean? You got to, you got to look at their movements and see how they talk to each other. And uh, it took some time. Trust me, it took some time. And then eventually it got to, we didn't even have to walk into the yard with our elephant hooks because they knew they weren't going to get hit. You know, it's like everybody knows that, you know, you, just, you knew you weren't. I listen, I went to Catholic high school and grammar school. We all knew, you know, you know, the pointer, we know what that meant. So you're always in fear of that. And it worked. It took some time and it took breaking them up. So we would seriously, we would still hear the screams coming from the Asian barn in the morning. See, we were on like a hill above the Asian yard. It's the best way to put it. You know, in California, everything slopes up. So we were on a hill, and then off to the other side was the Asian barn. And you could hear them getting hit. You could hear them screaming at the top of their lungs. And uh, for no other reason, but you could. Because that's the culture they were. See, when there used to be the guy in charge of the elephants. I'm going to go backwards a little bit. His name was Franz Tisch. And he was brutal, from what I heard. Mm. And, uh, he beat one of our elephants. In the business, in the circus business, in the animal business, especially in circuses and roadside, you always want to prove that you can break an African elephant. And so he took little Bizu, the little smallest one there, she was like 12 years old, and just destroyed her and beat her and pulverized her. And, and just, you just felt sorry for her. But then I didn't see it because all the other ones were semi-wild. You know, the group that I worked with came in out of Africa in 1972. They opened the Wild Animal Park in 72. And uh, and nobody, nobody touched them. Nobody went near them. They were afraid of them. So Franz would use a bullwhip and bring them in the barn at night, chain them up in the morning, get them out. And that was it. And nobody, nobody took care of them. Nobody went around them. And then they started taking care of them. Steve was one of them. Lou was one of them. And, uh, and then to not go backwards, but here's where the trauma comes in is that then five babies were born there because there was a bull elephant there named Chico. Mm. And if you ever want to be around a huge animal, 
I think he was, I think he was 12 feet at his shoulders. I've never been around any other animal that was huge. Mm -hmm. I could stand next to him. I couldn't, but I mean, my head would just fit into his armpit. And, uh, but they had babies and two of them died. And then out of one day, uh, you find out this stuff later as you go on going, why are they, why are they so sad? You know, what's, what's, what's the gig? You know, we're treating them halfway decent. They're in, they're in jail, you know, what they're in. And Steve moved them. They shipped three of the, of the other babies. They went in one day and basically chained up the mothers and took their babies away. Hmm. They just took their babies away for no other reason, because you're going to hear this lot because they could. Mm -hmm. And they traded them for who knows what, an Steve would know if he's, what animals they traded them for. And they shipped them off to China, hmm. which are now one of the largest importers of elephants for ex ex But you don't know that. And you don't know how sad they are. And uh, and to move a little forward, because I can talk for 20 hours on this, <laughs> is what happened was uh, Sabu, who was technically the matriarch. See, there was elephants that came out of Africa. It was Sabu, it was Atari, it was Shapi, it was the Tima, and it was Mandavu. And, uh, and then they brought in Peach from the San Diego Zoo, the one that kicked me, because she had a reputation of just beating the crap out of keepers, picking them up and throwing them. And she really did. She did it with me. She was, she was the mental. She wasn't mental base shark. She was the boss. Hmm. It was like you had people work in the neighborhood, but she was John Gotti. You know, she was just everybody. Just don't go near it, and everybody they didn't. And then you had Hatari, who was in the famous movie with John Wayne. Hatari. Hmm. She was named after the movie she was in. If you ever watched that movie, which is really horrible, it's about capturing animals. She was one of the baby Africans chasing El Elsa Martinelli around. So she was there and she was a movie star and she knew it. She had been pampered her whole life. And then there was little crazy beezy. So the main group was the main group. Mm -hmm. And then one day out of nowhere, after everything was done, you know, the Asians were down off of, you know, they left early and uh, they had their own. Sabu started developing, which is the best way to describe it was, uh, there was a big ball. It looked like uh, the size of a volleyball, basically. And it was covered with, it looked like bleeding grapes. It was just all pus coming out all over the place. And uh, we knew, we know it later that it was caused by stress and depression and everything else going through. It was, you know, like everybody in society, stress and depression will cause, you know, problems with your body. And so we had to, this is how weird it was. The vets at the Wild Animal Park weren't qualified to do surgery on her. So we actually had to hire a very famous guy, I don't know what his name was, who was a horse surgeon to come in and cut out that what was ever in there was on a long three foot shaft. She was still sad. They were all sad. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know what else to do. We Asians were gone. We were treating them nice, but you could tell and anybody that's ever been around elephants, you can tell in their eyes. She was just sad. Mm -hmm. So we, because we got away with a lot of stuff, you know, which we did, some of us know our background, you know, found out the curator had a high school education and the elephant supervisor, Alan Grucraft, had never worked with elephants. So we had a lot of freedom. It was, we really did. And going back, you know, the middle 80s, you can't get away with the stuff we got away with. So Lou's wife happened to know, because she was into meditation and, you know, crystals. She had heard of this really famous animal whisperer, that technically is the best term, out of San Diego. Her name was Samantha Curie. And uh, and we figured something's wrong with them. We can't figure it out. Nobody else can. We were asking all these quote unquote elephant experts, what's wrong with them? Ah, uh, we don't know. So everyone had that answer. We don't know, we don't know. <laughs> so we decided to bring her in because she did have a reputation. Whether anybody believes that stuff, they don't have to. But we didn't either. We figured, well, let's give it a shot. We had nothing else to do. So we brought her in to at least see if she could talk to the elephants. And it was weird because we brought her in and she stood outside of the moat. And uh, Sabu, who never left the herd, she never, ever left that little group. She was always within five feet of everybody, especially Wanky. And she stood on the opposite side of the whole yard, was two and a half acres, and was talking. To Sam was on one side, and Sabu was there for over an hour. They stood and looked at each other. And we kept thinking, eh, something's up. <laughs> no, really, something was up, because we even when we went in the yard, just to hang, Sabu never moved. Mm -hmm. And she was the mental matriarch. Mm -hmm. 
And the word came back. I don't know all the you know logical terms. The word eventually came back was they never got to say goodbye. And what I didn't find out until later is about a year before I got there, one of the elephants, Mandavu, had died. And at that time, they just went in with a skip loader in the barn and scooped her up and took her away. And the more you learn about elephants, the more you read about them, is uh, they do what we do. They, you don't want to use the term wakes, but they honor their dead. They do in the wild. They'll line up single file for miles sometimes. And to go in to say goodbye. And what we do as humans, we have two day wakes, sometimes one day now. But we have two day wakes and elephants have three days. They have three day wakes. It's, it's three days. Mm-hmm. And us being a little crazy at the time and bored, we knew that Madavo's skull was in the boneyard. See, in all zoos and all wild animal parks, they have boneyards where they dig up, they take the dead animals and they put them into a pit and all the beetles eat them. They clean them so you don't have to clean them on your own. So we said, Lou had her tusk at his house. And uh, we said, why don't we just give it a shot? I had read, you know, Gay's book hadn't been out. I was reading Ian Douglas Hamilton and I was reading uh, Cynthia Moss. I was reading, you know, about elephant culture. So you have some background knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we went, dug up our skull. Thinking we were just going to give it and everybody knew about it. We were in the reader in San Diego. There was an article about this. That's how weird it got. And Rucroft came up and he goes, they're going to go crazy. Looking for an excuse, because we got a little arrogant at that time, an excuse to write us up for doing something that he didn't want us to do. So we took the skull and put it on the barn, on the, on the top of the barn to dry it out. And then we came back the next day, and I'm not making any of this stuff up. The elephants had not slept that night. And everybody that could reach the inside roof of that barn, it was dripping with elephant snot. And then we said, eh, we got something now. Something was going on. Some energy was, we couldn't see. They could see it or they could feel it. Mm-hmm. So we put the skull in the yard and, uh, you know, we, Peach didn't really care. You know, Hitari couldn't care. Hitari was signing autographs at that time. She was so famous. You know, I knew, she really didn't. She was, they weren't mentally there, but the rest of them were. Mm-hmm. And when I walked Sabu out in that yard that day, the scream she gave out was deadly. Mm-hmm. And, they, and I, we didn't have uh, cell phone cameras at the time. So I couldn't record it, but I took a bunch of pictures of them all going up with their ears out and touching them going through. And to fast forward, three days later, the Tima, who was her closest friend in the herd when they came in, walked right up to the tusk. Everybody had kind of faded away a little bit at that time. She walked up, took the tusk out, which they do in the wild, and spun it around and played with it and everything and dropped it on the ground. And that was it. It was over. But the atmosphere in the yard changed. Mm-hmm. It's like we weren't keepers anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. We, were, we were part of the herd. Mm-hmm. We did something to them that nobody else did. I don't think they can do it now. I really don't think you can get away with it now. You know, they're learning a little bit. I have seen reports of other zoos when the babies die, they let the ones that are in the snow go up and touch them or, you know, but we let them go through a death rite. And uh, forever, for the time I was still there, that spot on that ground they would always go past and smell. But it changed everything. You could see the life in their eyes again. You know, we literally, all of them, they all became awake again, as opposed to, they were dying. We knew they were dying. But that raised, you know, that raised our ego a little bit more because we said, nah, who's going to touch us now? You know, especially when you're in the reader and everybody heard about it. And then, uh, and to fast forward, so I don't take up all your time, is the, this went on for, you know, I was up under with the Africans for three years. And uh, first year was gone. This was afterwards. And then uh, then it was so much easier. There was a time while I was still there where I took care of them for a month by myself, which is taboo in the elephant business. It's just a written law. You don't ever work by yourself. Hmm. And I even had, I mean, you can't get away with it now. When I look back how much we got away with my ex-wife, who was five feet tall, weighed 90 pounds, she used to come in and help me clean the barn and help me clean the yard. Really, but they're so mean and they're going to kill you and everything. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And you're thinking, well, that ain't, my, that ain't my kids. They just, and really, and they would come up and they would just greet. We would bring in people, you know, school groups that come up. We ran anybody because they're tactile and they're, they love to be touched and they love to smell you. 
Mm-hmm. Anybody that's been around elephants, how they greet you is they smell you where you sweat. They smell your feet, between your toes, your crotch, and your armpits, and they greet you in your mouth so they can smell your breath. That's mm-hmm. how they sight you. Mm-hmm. And I remember working on my own. I remember one time closing by myself. I would say, and I, this is how easy it got. And this is what, unfortunately, gives you more, you know, you think you're tougher than you really are because you're actually working for somebody. They weren't my elephants. I was able to go in the yard at night and say, time to go to bed. And they would walk up and follow behind me and they would stand in line while I hooked each one of them up and see you tomorrow morning. Mm-hmm. And it was that easy. But we got a little cocky and started mouthing off. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember, you know, I remember the head of advertising came up to me one time when I was out. Uh, he goes, you're asking too many questions. <laughs> he goes, you're just asking too many questions. He goes, stop mm-hmm. it. I said, I'm not asking, I just want to know. Mm-hmm. So one day they caught us off guard and they sent up the assistant operations manager and the guy that was in charge of the trams just knocked on the barn door and started asking me and Lou questions about what we thought about Rucroft and what we thought about Kiltman. Boom, boom, boom. The next day, Ray or transferred out of the Asian elephants. Mm. Next day, the next day. Mm. Rucroft didn't want it. I didn't want it. I got to leave my girls. The girls didn't know where I went. You know, all of a sudden I'm not there one day. Mm. And, uh, and then I got to see the other side of the business. Mm. And uh, they didn't let me go near the elephants. I'll show you if I don't know if you can see. Can you see this picture? Does that picture come through? Yeah, a bit. That's yeah. My, that's my, that was my job. <laughs> mm. I would come in the morning and go down and hang out with her. Two Aunt Coley Kettles, male and female, because they didn't want me near the barn. They mm. didn't want it. And why? Mm-hmm. And uh, the other sad part about her, another thing is that uh, while I was there, she gave birth to a little calf and the next day they took it away. Mm-hmm. And you want to hear an animal that's fully lactated screaming out of pain. Mm-hmm. And you could hear her moans during the day and I'm going, you know, I'm getting, you know, you get a different side of it. I came to, I came from really a nice working situation to uh an extremely abusive, mean relationship. You know, and Pat Humphrey, I don't care if he hears this, he was one of the most brutal brutal human beings I've ever met. You could always tell when he had an argument with somebody, could have been his wife, could have been a friend, he would come in and just pulverize those elephants. Mm. He would brag, he actually was bragging one time that he was actually able to hit an elephant and drop it to its knees. And... I remember when I was in there the first time, this is when Cindy tried to get me again. Mm. And, uh, and poor Cindy, you know, I don't want to backtrack, but she actually, one of the keepers, eventually what happened was everybody got the word that, uh, working in the elephant atmosphere was a joke. Mm. We were revered at one time. I mean, people looked at us going, you're taking care of elephants, you know, and everything, you know, we were in with them at that time. We went in with them and then people quit because it became a joke and they didn't like the beatings. So eventually everybody that came working at the elephants, were there anybody that was taking tickets at the elephant rides? Mm. Actually, actually, the guy that took over the Africans from us never had a pet in his whole life. Mm -hmm. He was just a nice kid. And he took, you know what I mean? He took, so you start getting all these feelings that are going on. And, uh, and obviously I would say what I felt like saying, and they didn't want me around. Eventually, they let me do the rides because there was nobody else left. Mm. And they had to have Pat Humphrey in the yard to take care of Cindy trying to kill everybody. Mm. This poor kid one day, I felt so bad for him. He was just so innocent like I was. Remember I told you when I first come in, you yeah. come in starry-eyed and you love working. And when you're in the elephant barred area, the stalls are designed, they're about this far apart is where the metal comes down. She blew this kid through that. She slammed him through that opening, blew both of his shoulder blades out and everything. And uh, and she hated everybody, and she had a right to hate everybody. But she was like that because of us. And they embarrassed me. They had us run. They were doing shows. You know how embarrassing it was after working with the Africans to run down in front of the entertainment area and pick up bowling pins mm-hmm. and having the idiots in the, you know, applaud, you know, and elephants would sit on stools and you're going, say, you know, I, I was actually a keeper. And then I became a carny. Mm. I became a circus person. I became a carnival person. And I they still wasn't allowed to go near him. Eventually they broke down and allowed me to do some rides. And uh, and the funny thing was I kept getting brought into the curator's office. 
Hmm. Because first time it happened when I was doing the rides, he brought me down there and uh, he would say, Ray, you can't keep telling them they don't like doing the rides. And th what I would do, there was two shifts. You would take an elephant and you would go around in a circle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes 95 degrees out with a bunch of overweight people on the back, you know, <laughs> paying a buck. And it was cool for them. We did elephant rides. And I thought, weren't we in the business of conservation and education, you know, and stuff mm -hmm. like that? We were circus. And I would say to them, I said, I didn't say they didn't like the rides. They would ask me, do you think they like doing it? Mm -hmm. And I would say, why don't, what do you think? Then the word got down. You can't tell them that. I said, okay, okay, no big deal. And uh, the final straw was uh, they used to do concerts at the Wild Animal Park. And uh, this is when I knew it was time to get out. And Roger Miller was a country and western singer at the time. And uh, he came down to the barn. Because I wasn't allowed to go in the yard to help clean that much, I was hosing down the barn. And he goes, I got a question for you. Wrong guy to ask, okay? <laughs> he goes, why I heard there's an elephant here that's trying to kill people. Literally trying to kill people. Because mm -hmm. everybody knew Cindy at that time. She'd been bumped around from Tacoma and every other you know place. And, uh, and I said, Mr. Miller, what do you think you have to do to an elephant that is an herbivore, has no natural enemies on this planet to get it to kill a human being? Mm -hmm. What do you think you have to do to that animal? One hour later, radio, go down to Kilmar's office again. <laughs> And he said, you can't keep telling them that. Mm. And I said, I'm telling them the truth. And I really meant it. This is when I was right at the end of, you know, you had to go eventually. Sure. And because uh, they didn't want me down there. In that interim time, uh, before this conversation went on, Connie got pregnant. One of the, the big thing with certain people in the elephant business is ego and show. And you want to show that you're, you know. So Connie was one of the youngest. She got pregnant. And, uh. They brought in National Geographics while I was there. Brought everybody in there. They had Klieg lights on her. The poor thing had lights on her all the time so they could film the birth of the baby in a stall, not in the yard, in a stall. And as it got closer and closer, I kept going around telling everybody, you know, that baby's dead. You can just tell that the baby was, there was no movement. There was nothing. And uh, Lou came down one day. Yeah, I'm going backtrack. I'm going all over the place, but... <laughs> He came back and he said to me, he goes, you know, they already said you can go back up to the Africans. Quit telling them the baby's going to be dead. Mm -hmm. Telling everybody they got a dead baby. And what happened? She broke her water and no baby. Mm -hmm. Three days later, they had to induce labor and went in and yanked the baby out dead. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you kind of get, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. You know, we actually called... Uh, Hamburg Zoo, where Rucroff used to work at or claimed he had worked at. Mm. And it was at least 15 minutes of them laughing hysterically. Mm -hmm. Said we, he never worked elephants here. He was the boy at that time that we gave a bucket to. With At that time, he reintroduced it to the Wild Park. We had monkey biscuits. And all the tourists would line up, and the elephants would come to the edge of the moat, and you were able to hand feed them biscuits. Mm. To get an experience of not understanding that maybe one of those idiots would have given them something that could have killed them. Sure. You know what I mean? And so then we then you start realizing, you know, what am I here for? Mm -hmm. You know, really, what am I here for? You know, there is no matter what anybody says, there is no educational value in zoos. There is what we say. There's a Glock effect. Mm. It's like everybody's been there. Everybody's been driving down the road, huh? And all of a sudden, traffic stops. Mm -hmm. Right, and why? Why? Because you slow down to look at the accident. Mm -hmm. and that's what zoos are. Mm -hmm. You stop at this, then you go, "Mommy, Daddy, let's go to this one." You know, let's go this mm -hmm. one. Let's go to this one. And uh, and it was, it's just what it was. It was a joke. There mm -hmm. was nothing educational. There just wasn't. Mm -hmm. There wasn't. I mean, it's a, I don't know how to say it. So I had to have surgery on my wrist, and uh, because the elephant choppy by accident, my hook went through my wrist, and I'm left-handed. Mm -hmm. So I had to get surgery done. So it gave me three months to get on workman's comp and get out, mm -hmm. get out. And, uh, and I did eventually I wound up getting another job. And, uh, but before I left, it was right at the end of my time. There is when they brought Dunda up and everybody that's been around circus people, including Rucroft, they always take pictures and videos of them. So he wanted to prove he could introduce Dunda 
from the San Diego Zoo because she was African to our group. And I would have been part of it. I think I already told you. I would have been part of this had I been still working there. They chained her up and put come-alongs and drug her out on, on her sternum for two straight days and beat her with axe handles for five hours each day. Pulverized her. They didn't hit her. They beat her. And then, thank God, Steve, who had been the, you know, the keeper at the zoo, he went forward. There was pictures taken. Everything went on. And, and we had hearings. And it finally came out, Senator McCorkdale. We had a, uh, a hearing in Escondido about abuse. And here's what really bothered me, and I've, you know, I've mentioned it to a lot of people, is all they would have had to have done has said, we were wrong. Mm -hmm. We made a mistake. We were wrong. We should never have done this to her. We, had ne we should never have done it. And so at the hearing that we had at the local hearing in Escondido, they said, Kilmar actually stood up in front of the senator, and the senator said, don't you think that's abuse? Mm -hmm. Don't you think there's in there some? He goes, no. He goes, I don't think there's any abuse. That's standard procedure when you take care of elephants. And he said her skin was falling off her head. We have pictures. No, that's standard procedure. And then it all came out. Mm. And then McCorkadale said, because we asked him to, because nobody else would, uh, Mr. Kilmore, you're the curator of all the animals at the Wild Animal Park. What's your education? Well, I graduated from high school. And it, the whole mm -hmm. crowd derby was there. Cleveland Amory was there. We we're mm -hmm. all, you know, we were all speakers. And there was a hush that went over the crowd. And he said, You're the curator. He goes, Have you taken any college classes? Like biology, zoology, physics, any ologies? He mm -hmm. goes, No, I took one accounting class years ago. And that's who I was working for. Mm -hmm. And so that then I then I gave up. I wound up taking I went wound up leaving and working with abused kids. So I went from abused to abused. Mm -hmm. And then came back to Chicago and I gave up like everybody else did, Olivia. Everybody just, you said, I'm done with this crap. Mm -hmm. It just anks at you. And I was an advisor in 2003 to 2004 at a, they were doing a play downtown Chicago called Big Dreams, mm -hmm. ironically about abusing elephants in captivity. Mm -hmm. And it was, and you probably know where it's at. It was the Antium Theater down, downtown Chicago off Fullerton. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And they have, yeah, you, but it's a cool place. They have three different venues and I was in one of them. Mm -hmm. And then one of the, one of the, uh, the person that was the director of the play came and she goes, you know, they're bringing some elephants in from San Diego mm -hmm. to stay in Lincoln park. Mm -hmm. And then it starts again. You're going real. Then that, you know, then they, so we waited until they, uh, they were released out of quarantine, which I don't understand quarantine because there was no other animals around them, mm -hmm. but they, they came out of Southern California. You want to talk about mental abuse. And sadness. They came out of Southern California their whole lives. And one day they were sitting in a barn, and you know where you know where Lincoln Park's at, mm -hmm. with all the noise and all the pollution and all the cars and all the traffic and the cold. Yeah. And the cold. And uh, so I videotaped me going and seeing them. I still have it. I think Gay seen the video when I went and saw them again after like nine years, ten years, and uh, they almost fell in the moat mm -hmm. to come and greet me. And me, once again with my ego, said, "I'm going to get you guys out of here." Mm -hmm. I'm going to get you out of here. And uh, boy, was I wrong. And here's when you find out how zoos lie and tell you one story, which isn't a true story, is all of a sudden it was in the, all the newspapers that Datima, first of all, they changed her name to Tatima, but her name was Datima, D-E-T-E-M-A. Mm -hmm. And uh, she died. And everyone said the zoo put out a big, and I have the sheets from all the Chicago Tribune and sometimes she died from, uh, tuberculosis or some other upper respiratory disease that she had. And here's how she died is the guy that was taking care of the elephants at Lincoln park had never been around elephants, not even looked at one before mm. and how he was got the job. Cause I asked him one day, cause when I was, I used to go in and talk to him all the time. And uh, he said to me one day and I said, how did you get the job? And this is the logic of zoos. So everybody understands zoo logic. Mm -hmm. He said, I was taking care of the giraffes. And so their logic was giraffes. Africa, okay. African mm. elephants, Africa. Mm. So he goes, they gave me the job. He called Lou, I found out later, he called Lou every single day. He goes, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? Mm. And so what you do with elephants, especially in captivity, if they're on chains, they're not that much anymore, is you let them out and then you clean the barn. Mm -hmm. So what they would do is clean the barn and hose them down before they let them out. So the team left the barn one day and slipped and fell and broke her leg and they put her down. That was the first lie. Yeah. And then 
I had to go and watch Peach die. I don't know anybody that's been around, you know, big animals like that, but you watch them die of depression and sadness. Mm. They they just died. They just mm. she t I just watched her wither away and die. Yeah. And uh, and then the only one left was Wanky. Mm -hmm. And so me with my big mouth, mm -hmm. I called Mayor Daly. I called Mayor Daly's office. <laughs> I actually was going to have a meeting with Mayor Daly, the old Mayor Daly, not you know, you know the young one, not the old guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked to his secretary one day and she said, I hate to tell you this, Ray. She goes, he has no say over the Lincoln Park Zoo. Mm. I said, what's well, the Chicago Zoo? It's free. He goes, yeah. He goes, it's owned by a group, a private group out of the country that owns the Lincoln Park Zoo. He goes, you're wasting your time. So we got a couple council people that got involved. I testified in front of the city council of Chicago. We got somebody that really wanted to do this. And I called Pat on the phone. I called Derby. And I said, will you take Wanky if we can get her? She goes, if you can get her, we'll take her. We'll pay for it. And kind of the same thing that's going on with Billy, you know, in L.A. And uh, we knew that we knew we were going to win the vote. We knew we were going to we the city of Chicago was going to say, get her out of here. We've had enough bad PR. And the night before, what did they do? Came in and snuck her out the back door mm -hmm. on the way to go to Holville Zoo, which is in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And halfway there, she died. She just laid down and died. And you know what they said? Another PR lie. The zoo put out a big thing that she died when she was at the zoo. Mm. She died on the way there. And that's what that's when you learn about uh, zoos mm -hmm. and the business. Mm -hmm. And I was warned. I was warned by the lady, one of my professors at San Diego State. When I was done, she was a primatologist. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'll get you a job working in the zoos. But she goes... Why do you think I don't work in a zoo? Yeah. She said, you're going to find out. It's not the love of the animals or the people, not all of them, but some of the people that work with them. It's the business. Yeah. It's, in the, it's the business of exhibition. And if you don't like it, too bad. Mm -hmm. they, you don't. Even I'll bring up Billy now. Bob Barker offered the LA Zoo $5 million to release that elephant from the LA Zoo. And wouldn't you think, just logically out of, you know, let's just say you don't have any knowledge of any psychology, that you would think that's good PR. Sure. They just did it at the North Carolina Zoo. They just released a big bull elephant named Marty to the elephant sanctuary in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And the smart way they did it is the sanctuary gave the zoo all the credit. Mm -hmm. And the zoo came out with a statement saying, we know that the best thing for at this animal, we've had enough ex exhibition need to retire and live out the rest of their lives mm -hmm. and smell real grass, mm -hmm. you know, and not, you know, smell real trees. But for some reason, certain ones don't do it. And I don't know. And if anybody knows, I've asked a lot of my friends that are attorneys too, why are zoos exempt from animal abuse laws? Mm -hmm. Nobody gives me those answers. Why? Mm -hmm. What they did to Dunda was horrible abuse, but everybody still kept their jobs. You know what I mean? I don't, you know, and not that I have something over on anybody. There's lots of people out there that have sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. They're not profit. You know, you have Carulos. Mm -hmm. You have LEC. You have the Elephant Nature Park. You know, you have other ones. You have the Global Sanctuary for Elephants in Brazil. There are other people, you know, it's not like there's just a few people out there. Right. But there's, there's something about the zoo business that I, if anybody knows, anybody can help me out <laughs> because... I had to work at a psychiatric hospital just as an internship when I was getting my little psychology degree. The other word for psychiatric hospitals is zoos. Mm -hmm. James Taylor wrote a, a song, Knocking Around a Zoo, when he was in it. But people don't think that way. They think that they're helping them. Mm -hmm. And the new thing now is uh, species survival plans. Mm -hmm. That's why they're breeding everybody. That's why they brought in the elephants out of Swaziland. And don't think that wasn't a big thing. Think of what it costs to bring those elephants twice, 2003 and 2016, and they're going to be doing it again. Mm -hmm. Think of what it costs to bring in a 747 transport plane loaded with elephants out of Africa. At least there was five or six stops. Charles Siebert wrote about it in the New York Times and the money that's involved. And there's this attitude that we don't care what you think. Mm -hmm. We're going to do it anyhow. And if you don't like it, too bad. And they, that's the attitude. It's just amazing that they're not held accountable. Yeah. Uh, would I love to? Sure. I tried. 
You know, I spoke at state Senate in California when they changed the laws and with Cleveland, Cleveland Amory next to me, it was Cleveland, me, Pat Derby, and David Herbert, who was the head of the Humane Society, mm -hmm. sitting across from Warren Thomas, who was the head of the LA Zoo at that time, and uh, Doug Myers, who was in charge of San Diego. And after everything was said and done, Warren Thomas actually off camera, nobody heard him, but I heard him because everybody started talking. You know, we're thinking of doing... We're thinking, and he meant this. It's quote unquote. We're thinking of bringing in to the uh, the shops at the LA Zoo elephant tables made out of elephant ears. Hmm. He actually said that in front of all of us, and and at the other end of you said, and you know you can get elephant waste paper baskets made out of their feet. And I'm thinking, and you're in charge of a zoo, so I don't know. I, you know, I, I it was a great experience for me. Mm -hmm. And all I can tell you is what did help with Lincoln Park, as you know, because you're from Chicago, mm -hmm. is uh, there's no elephants in Brookfield and mm -hmm. in Lincoln Park. And right before the elephants died at Lincoln Park, Brookfield had built a $10 million exhibit specifically mm -hmm. for elephants and rhinos right before Lincoln Park happened. Mm -hmm. And so I was given a talk one time at my daughter's, uh, Jessica, my oldest daughter's school at Tinley Park High School. And I got to give her biology teacher credit. She got everybody involved, all the parents and all the kids at all the other three high schools in the district, and they wrote letters to Lincoln Park Zoo and said, if you ever, ever, ever bring elephants here again, we're never coming here ever again. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows it. Come on, we've all been to zoos. We've been to Disneyland. How many yellow buses do you see lined up? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. their money. Mm -hmm. They don't care about tourists coming in two or three at a time. That's their money. And that stopped it. And... uh and nothing changed. Nothing mm -hmm. changed. It really didn't. You know, I went to the last time I was at the Wild Animal Park was years ago. And a friend of mine who was just there last year, he said, you don't want to go back. Mm -hmm. He goes, you just don't want to. It's just, it's not. Species survival plan is their new thing. That's why they're breeding. And it's not to bring them back to the wild. Ask anybody, go to a zoo, call a director, say, how many elephants have been released to the wild after you brought them in? Mm -hmm. How many animals have you released? The only reason the zoos, the LA Zoo and the Wild Animal Park in San Diego got creds is because of the condor project mm -hmm. when they released the condors because mm -hmm. they were, that was a federal thing. They had nothing to do with it. We just happened to be in the state where they came from. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. You know, I, you know, I, species survival plan is to keep breeding them to stock zoos. Yeah. They're moving them all over the country. I know who's moving them. Mm -hmm. So Steve, we don't have to give his name because he probably can kill me, but I know who's transporting them around the country. There's a male that from out of the wild animal park has been to, I don't know, three or four zoos already just to breed. Mm -hmm. They ship them around in the truck, yeah. but nobody knows about it because you don't, you know, you don't. We've talked about it. When you come out of 40 degrees below zero and you go into Florida Canyon in San Diego and the plush, you know, palm trees and yeah. ask, ask to see where they sleep at night. Mm. But I learned a lot. I learned, you know, I learned how powerful, you know, they've studied elephants. Mm -hmm. You know, they've done neurological studies on them and find out that they have the same neo uh, uh, cerebral cortex that we have. It's just bigger. Mm -hmm. And it's the areas of our brain that control emotion, mm -hmm. sociability, language. You know, we keep taking all these animals and teaching them our language. Why? He goes, did you ever try to learn an elephant language? We can't talk to somebody. We can't even go down the street without GPS in our cars now. Right. Can you imagine elephants? There's an elephant group out in Africa that they meet every single year, like a 4th of July party. <laughs> they mentally tell each other how to meet and where they meet. <laughs> That's what Sam told us. You can communicate with them mentally mm. if they let you. Yeah. You know, and so that what we learned. I was able to go out and just hang out. And yeah. so everybody else, but it's not that way anymore. Mm -hmm. And all the elephants are dead. Everyone I worked with is all dead. And even today, they'd still be alive if mm -hmm. they just left them alone. Mm -hmm. All the Asians, I think, are dead. And Ron Sapor died, the one that was the breeder. And, mm -hmm. uh, so I don't, I don't know. It's like, it's the trauma they go through, the trauma yeah. we inflict on them. Yeah. You know, it's just we do it to each other. So anybody has any answers to that, I don't know. You know, I can't, yeah. I can't go and look at them anymore. You know? Right. Right. And people, I, with your, with the book that you wrote from your experiences, it's um, just what you said about people not knowing what goes on. It's really, um, and I'm sure people have 
plenty of questions that they're going to want to ask you. So I want to make sure to leave time for that. But it, of course, it's um, it's just incredible to hear about the where your book came from and the experiences that it came from and what you managed to do with what you witnessed um, and the experiences that you had in these settings. Um, and well, you know what it was. You know what it was though. It yeah. was I made a, I made a promise. Mm -hmm. I remember the day I left the Wild Animal Park. I remember looking in Sabu's eyes and said, I promise you, I'm going to write your story. Yeah. And, uh, and, the, and the reason everyone asks me, why didn't you name everybody? I named the elephants, but why didn't you name the people that did it? And it was a theory. And Cleveland helped me out with this. Mm -hmm. I, I talked to Cleveland at least once a week. I talked to him a couple nights before he died. And uh, we became good buddies. And uh, he said, if you don't name the names, but they kind of know who they are, mm -hmm. that they have to come forward and say, that's me. Mm. So they would have to admit, instead of me accusing them, see how that you kind of reverse that as a, they would have to come forward and say, you know, that was me that beat him. Sure. You mentioned my name. And uh, Lou's wife actually started calling him Tony after my book. So I mentioned his name. She wouldn't even call him Lou anymore. Mm. She, and we laughed about it. She goes, but then he would have to admit that he did it. But uh, everything else was true. And Cleveland said to me a long time ago, anybody that's thinking about telling stories, yeah. don't ever lie. Mm -hmm. Don't ever lie. And it, uh, and it worked. It's still out there. I have to give my ex-wife credit. She helped me put it onto a floppy mm. because <laughs> I don't know how to use computers that well. So that was, that was nice. You know, it was, a, yeah. it was the, you know, a nice thing to do. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, you know what it is too? Is if anybody can help, I don't know, it's the next generation. My kids won't go to zoos. You know, they won't go to SeaWorld. You know, Blackfish closed SeaWorld down because somebody had the guts to come forward and say, here's what's going on. And how they bring the public back, and they do it at the Wild Animal Park. SeaWorld now has two roller coasters. Mm -hmm. They go right past all the animals, and underneath, the, you know, they, they set it up that way to bring people back in again in the Wild Animal Park. People just stop going. So now you can take a balloon ride. It rises above at the Wild Hunter Park in San Diego. So you can get on that and pay an extra 40 bucks, and you can look at the whole park. And they have a zip line. Mm -hmm. So you can zip line across. It's become a miniature Disney World. Mm -hmm. And there is an animal kingdom in Disney World. Everybody knows there's elephants there. And the ironic thing was a guy named Rick Baranji, who used to work at the zoo, wound up being in charge of the elephants in Disney World. They're all very protective of each other, and but it's the kids. Mm -hmm. It's the kids. I when I would go to the Lincoln Park and I would sit there just you know by myself, and watch, you know everybody come by and not all of them are tourists. A lot of them are you know from Chicago like we are. And it would be the kids going. They look so sad. Yeah. And that would come from the innocence of a child's voice. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it would it would be them eventually saying, "I don't want to go." That's what happened. Why do you think Ringling's closed? Right. It wasn't out of the compassion of their hearts for elephants. They don't give a rat's ass about elephants. They could care mm -hmm. less. They're still chained up down in Florida. Mm -hmm. It's a breeding facility now. It was because people stopped spending money and going there. Mm -hmm. And the other side of that is, if you don't go to the zoos, then they're going to make you feel guilty that you're not helping to pay for the other animals' food. Right. See what I mean? There's this, there's this schizophrenic way to look at it. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they stop going, they'll, they'll shut down. Eventually, they will. At least 20 zoos now that I know of have stopped having elephants. They just have. They just. Yeah. Ron Kagan was way ahead of his time in Detroit. He was the first one, and boy, did he get his butt slapped. Right. He lost his accreditation for months. And he was told, because I've talked to him personally, he was told by the people that own the Detroit Zoo, you open your mouth again, we're going to fire you. Wow. So he can't even say anything now. He can't say anything. That's the control they have over you. Yeah. And it is a draw. I, I can't tell you what a draw that is. I've been there. You put up with that because anybody else know anybody that's taking care of elephants lately? You know what I mean? There's sure. that draw that you're doing something that you don't know anybody else that was doing, even though you're uh, part of the problem. You're, you know, right. you're, oh, it's looking. We, we take kids that are 18 years old and we send them off to war. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, ask them if they really want it to go. Right. It's, you know, you just, it's up, it, they make you feel guilty and they make you play with your head mm -hmm. and uh, they convince you that they're mean. 
wouldn't it be great if he just told everybody coming and looking at elephants, you know, they're smarter than we are. <laughs> they take they care of their young better than we do. Mm-hmm. Get this, they're run by women. What a great concept. <laughs> really, what a, what a crazy concept. <laughs> oh, really, when you think about it, I was, well, listen, when I grew up, I was raised by women. Mm-hmm. You no, know, because our dads all worked. We only had one car in the family. And then one day you get to be 18, you know what they say to you? Go out and be a man. Mm-hmm. You know what? Really? It, it, it's such a com- convoluted nut job. We, we should learn from them. They're the largest of us. Mm-hmm. They take care of their babies. They mm-hmm. mourn like we do. You know, they do. And they love each other. Not mm-hmm. all of them. You don't have to like them all. I mean, I have seven <laughs> brothers and sisters. I'm sure some might be listening. I don't get along with all of them. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, you just don't. Sure. But the ones you do, you're connected to. Yeah. And But they won't promote that. There's something in our psyche, the male psyche, that won't admit, first, that we're wrong. And first, that there's another creature on this planet that's smarter than we are. Mm-hmm. Really, what we do is we cage them up. Go to a dolphin show. You don't think they're not smarter than we are? They communicate by echolocation. Right. Try it sometime. <laughs> you know what I mean? We can't even yeah. do that. But we right. make the but we we gather them up because we can. Yeah. And it goes back, and, and I brought this up, which I have to bring up again. Two things I don't want to get the religious aspect. I don't want to go there because I'll probably get crucified. But when you when you're told that you have dominion over all the animals by something that's you know out there, you, you don't want to challenge that, so you don't. And then Walt Disney. Let's talk about Walt, huh? Mm. Don't pull the elephant. Mm. And I'm 68, my generation, and generations still after that, and before that, were raised with the thought that elephants were dumb. And they showed them in films as being stupid, mm-hmm. not showing them as loving, caring, intelligent mm-hmm. animals, you know? And I just think it's, we don't want to admit that there's another species out there that does a better job than we do. Mm-hmm. Really, think about it. Yeah. They do a better job. Watch them with their babies. Yeah. Really. And watch them, you know, they just, they're just, and I was lucky. I was really lucky. If I had wound up with the Asian elephants, I would have lasted six months. Mm-hmm. I wound up I wound up with a semi-wild herd of really cool, big women. <laughs> We're just nurturing. I used to go in the yard and Sabu would grab me by her trunk and you can't get away when they grab you. And she would throw me underneath her belly and put her legs around me and hold me, just like they do in the wild with their babies. Mm-hmm. And it was an interesting experience because you knew they weren't faking it. They weren't trying to be nice. Right. But but you have to get to that point. And now the other end of it is now they have protective management, right. which is they don't even go in with them. Mm-hmm. You know, and they I hate to say they don't get how much they love hugging and touching. Mm-hmm. And we think we're so special. Everybody that's listening, look at your hand right now and blow up the design on your skin mm-hmm. and put it next to an elephant. It's exactly mm-hmm. the same. <laughs> it is. It's exactly the same. The mm-hmm. hair is kind of in the same place too. But it's it's just, and now they didn't even go in with them. And so mm-hmm. now they're, a friend of mine went to the park uh, last summer and said, they don't even have them, don't even roam around the park anymore. Mm-hmm. They stand up at the front where the gate's at because that's their only contact with humans because you come up and you put your foot out and now they're trained by whistles and bells. And it's like, they look at us going, Really? Can't you do any yeah. better than that? You know, it's like they're so intelligent and they're so uh, special, I guess is the best yeah. way to put it. Yeah. And they just wake you up. They wake you up to how small you are. You want to think you're tough? Stand next to a 10-foot elephant. <laughs> really, they can run faster than you can. Yeah. And But they don't. Mm-hmm. They just want to come up, They just want to come up and be with you. Mm-hmm. And you can see it. Look at Lek. Watch any of her videos at the Elephant Nature Park. She's got 56 elephants there. And she goes out by herself. She's only like 4'10". And they come up and they run up to her. And they hug her. And they, you know, they throw themselves at her. Because that's who they are. It's right. not who we are. Right. It's not who we are. And uh, I don't know. Maybe we will learn. I don't know. You know? They, they, get, they, get, they get rid of the people that care. Let's put it that way. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. I don't know. Absolutely. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully it'll change. I don't know. You know? <laughs> It has changed. It has changed because most of the keepers now are women of elephants, mm. which is a good start. Yeah. Which no, it's a good start because that's a different feel. Mm-hmm. It just is. You know, 
I can walk the streets of Chicago because I grew up in a not a tough area, but I grew up, you know, I can handle myself. But it's the other end. It's the compassionate side. Mm-hmm. It's the love side, you know, and they just they're just nice. Yeah. Best way to put it. And they don't try to kill you. So and they do have a right. They're all, I would never made it as an elephant. I'm telling you, Olivia, I would have I would have taken somebody out in the first week. You're going to hit me. This is what hit feels like, <laughs> you know. No, really, you would have. And uh, but it, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just power and control and ego sure. Sure. that we think. That we think, you know, our way is the best way. Yeah, we and do. Really, it's it, we what well, we do. We just we think, and we do. And if you don't like mm-hmm. it, we're going to do it anyhow. Right. I mean, right. this just even recently, the money that's involved. Mm-hmm. And I remember Jim Dolan, who's passed away right now. He was in charge of the, uh, San Diego Zoo for a long time. I remember him going up to the elephant barn one time with us, and he goes, "I hate elephants." And he was the boss. <laughs> he goes, "I hate him." And, you know, we'd say, why? He Because because they're the most expensive. Because, you know, you're buying hay. When I was there, it was 75 uh, bucks a bale. I don't know what it is now for it. Uh, and then the care for them and the maintenance that you have to take care of. And uh, But there's something about them that people are still fascinated by. Mm-hmm. It is, maybe it is their intelligence. Yeah. You know, it's maybe one day they're going to look at us going, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> Really, you just, they look at you and they, they look down at you. It's like I remember beating the crap out of Peach. And she was looking down at me going, that's that's your best shot. Mm. You know, not understanding that she could have crushed me anytime. Mm-hmm. But they put up with it. Mm-hmm. And I don't, maybe that was a lesson they taught me. Yeah. As much as you want to fight back, sometimes you have to step back and say, you know, what's the old Nez Pierce saying? You want to pick mm-hmm. up Native American? I will fight with you forever, no more. Mm. You know, it's like, some somewhere they just have to just first of all quit collecting them. Yeah, you know we, we don't have a right to do that anymore. Right. Because yeah. because honestly, when I started in the biz, there wasn't the Animal Planet on TV. Mm-hmm. There wasn't Nature Channels. There wasn't four hundred channels. Let's start there. Some of us remember three channels, and you know, you know what do you call it? The your the little things coming out the your antenna. Mm-hmm. And now you can go and watch anything. They actually have a show every other Saturday from the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Wild Animal Park. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to go see them anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, like I tell everybody, you want to go see Mickey Mouse? You got to go to two places. You have to get in your car or a plane and drive and go see Mickey. Mm-hmm. That's, you know what I mean? So if you really want to go see elephants, go on the LA camps. Carol Buckley has one down in Georgia. I know the elephant uh, sanctuary in Tennessee has an LA cam. So you don't, you don't have to go back. You know, we don't have to bring them to us anymore. Right. We still have that mentality, or some people do. Maybe the next generation won't. I got to give the director of the uh, North Carolina Zoo. That's not easy to let go. And wouldn't it be great out in L.A. if the director, after all the protest, Bill B- Bob Barker offering uh, five million bucks, and he was going to pay for the transport to pause, and. Uh, for them to come out and say, we get it. Mm-hmm. We, we just get it. We go, we're sorry we let him stay here this long. You would have more people going to the LA Zoo and going to see them thinking that they finally accepted the fact that we're doing it wrong. We did it wrong. They need we, we, we learned. We learned. We were wrong. Somehow that ego comes in and that we just we can't admit that we're wrong. Right. And we are wrong. You know, I'm sure that, I'm sure there's some animals that, you know, may do better in captivity, but not elephants. They all lose half their life in captivity. All of them. Sometimes younger. I don't know how many. All my allies are dead, except for Peach. I don't know. Maybe Peach would still be alive. She was 55 when she came to uh, Lincoln Park. So that was, you know, it was 80. It was 2003. So she might be 80. Who knows? Right. But the rest, of my, the rest of them are all dead. And believe it or not. Every, everybody's heard of people dying from broken hearts. Mm-hmm. Imagine having your family one day, these little guys come in <laughs> and dart you and numb you up and take you away from your family. How sad that is. Right. But we're not that much different. How many of everybody that can hear me right now, how many of you ever go next door and talk to your neighbor? Mm-hmm. You know, we live where it's, and now because of COVID and now because of cell phones. 
you've ridden the L like I have. Anybody talk anymore? <laughs> Everybody's this. Yeah. There's, there, nobody's even talking to each other anymore. Right. So to convince, to convince them, hey, you know, but it may happen. It's right. if the leadership, if the leadership changes, I don't know. It does. It doesn't seem like it. So I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. I'd yeah. like to. I'd like to have more answers. All I can do is say what you learned and pass it on. I guess. Yeah. So. Well, that's why we're so glad to be having these conversations with you and others. It opens the pathways for starting these this communication again and and hearing everything that you've learned and the experiences you've had and it's really it's been incredible right thank you so much for sharing no, it, sharing it's, no it's it was it, it was an honor it was an, it was it was an honor to speak at the elephant conference four years ago yeah and, uh, um it, at this point does anyone have any last minute questions that they'd like to ask ray before we let everybody go yeah mike It took me a while to learn to unmute oh, too. Does that does that do it? Yes. Yeah. We can hear you. No, I I uh, I was a veterinarian at San Diego too. Were you really? Wow. <laughs> so, so you I, know. So you know the game. <laughs> uh, I know the game. Um, I also worked at Omaha, <laughs> so I've been through the mill with it. But you know, when you ask why does it go on, that's there's so much money uh, in the zoo world. And there's so much power politically that it's almost impossible to stop it. They, You're they, right. They shouldn't confine elephant. They, they should have never confined elephants in the first place because they just aren't built for not walking twenty or thirty miles a day. Yeah, and uh, that's the way they that's the way they are in the wild. And you and you don't have to trim their feet in the wild either. No, you don't. But you you do in captivity. I. I yeah. think uh, elephants. I agree with you. They shouldn't. They shouldn't be. Definitely, a lot of animals shouldn't be in captivity. Well, one or organization that did it right, I think, is uh, the Arizona group out of Tucson that uh, did the uh, uh, the Sonoran Desert M Museum concept, where they yeah. utilized the natural resources in the area. They just put a wall around the. They just put a wall around the wild. Yeah, essentially it worked though pretty yeah, well. Yeah, it did work. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I went to talk to Carr down there, and uh, uh, in nineteen uh, about 1974, 75. No, it was probably earlier than that. To see if 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 we could move that concept into the Great Plains at Omaha, and I ran in headlong into Lee Simmons down there when I was working for him. And I just, I had to quit. I couldn't uh, go on with zoo work anymore. That was the end you, of so you, you reached that. You reached that point too. Yeah, well, another thing I was going to ask you, was Joan Embry working there when you were there? Yeah, you wanted to know Joan Embry's story? Well, yeah, I, you got what I wondered is why she let him get away with what... Well, what here's, here's, how, here's, here's, how, huh? here's, how Joan, here's how Joan got in the business, uh, which a lot of people don't know, is that they had a model that was going to go on Johnny Carson, everything else, and blah, you know, blah, blah, some, I don't know who it was. And she was scared to death of the animals. So on a last minute gig, they said, go to the San Diego Zoo and find somebody that looks Southern California. And she was working at the Children's Zoo at the time. Boom, she went up and she was, that's how she got in the biz. And eventually, which nobody knows, she has her own zoo behind her house. All the animals that she would show up in all the shows. Those are her animals. That's why they all got along with her. So she would bring her own animals on. And that's, she's eventually retired now, but that was how she, that's how, the, how she got in the business is she, they all wanted to be Jack Hanna. Why? I don't know, but they all want to be Jack Hanna. They all want to be on TV and their shows. And they would bring Carol in a truck from the San Diego Zoo up to uh, Johnny Carson just to go and stand, you know, and talk. And, uh, I don't know, but you're right about the money. You're right. It's the money that was involved in this last African. Can you imagine? I mean, I know it's big money just to move an elephant from one city to another. Can you imagine twice bringing a transport plane and pilots and coming from Africa and the money that was involved in that just to bring elephants here? Oh, you know? I, well, I just don't see how Joan, just knowing Joan, 
and her tenacious attitude. I don't see what, how you guys got away with beating elephants. I ju I just can't. Well, she she beat at, she beat animals too. Yeah, everybody did, but ninety percent of the time, the beatings occur when nobody's around. I don't. So nobody, I, boy, so, nobody I, so nobody sees it. Nobody sees it. Boy, I, I never did see that. I tell you, I did. No, nobody did. They would I beat worked, the elephants. I worked with Bob Wild there, in San Diego. Okay, I don't. I only heard the name. Bob, of yeah, Bob yeah. was uh, was the uh, on the, on the elephant string then. But Chuck Sedgwick, Sedgwick was the veterinarian there, and uh, Les Nelson. I don't know if you worked with him. Jim, no, I I worked with I worked with uh, Jim Osterheis. No, he's Jim still was, he's still at, Jim's still at the Wild Animal Park. Yeah, and uh, and I I worked just a little bit with Phil Ensley, and uh, he was working at the zoo, and then he. And he got in trouble too because he opened his mouth. So they, he actually lived around the corner from the zoo, but they transferred him to the Wild Animal Park. You know, you want you want to stay working? Drive an hour and a half. So, but I worked with him, and he's spoken out against elephant abuse, especially about oh, yeah. uh, Phil and Jim and I pretty much agreed on, on yeah. elephants. I mean, I don't know. I, I do you I, know? I, I mean, I don't know how how do I don't know, and nobody still nobody will give me an answer. If I put my dog outside and I'm in Chicago. And I put my dog outside on a chain and I leave it out for more than two or three hours, even if it's got water and food, somebody in the neighborhood's gonna call animal control or they're gonna call ASPCA and they're gonna get or they're gonna take the animal away from me. Because when we were at when we would hear the beatings going on at the Asian Bar, we called the Humane Society of San Diego. We called them and said, I want to make a formal complaint. And she was as honest as could be. And she said, Any complaints, and this was you know, the mid eighties. Any complaints that come in from the zoo in the wild animal park were told to throw in the circular file. That's the Humane Society of San Diego. Yeah, that was the, that was the control they had. And the the lead guy, I don't remember his name because I can't, you know, of Channel Five News in San Diego. The boss of Channel Five News was on the board of directors at the San Diego Zoological Society. So bad PR never came out. You never heard any bad PR. The only reason Dunda got any uh, play in the biz is because Senator McCorkadale up in Sacramento decided to take on the case because he saw how sick it was. But I nothing remember, changed. I remember taking on uh, the Wild Animal Park when they uh, started uh, killing uh, coyotes and bobcats out there. Yeah, and We yeah. started uh, Project Wildlife in San Diego. Because Did you really go? Yeah, good. we started that because of that move. And we went to the board of directors of San Diego Zoo and said if you don't if you don't stop killing coyotes, if you don't stop killing bobcats, if you don't stop killing predators out there, we're gonna put a stop to this whole process with the San Diego Union. We had the power to do it then. Good. Well I used to I met the guy that was killing all the uh, bobcats and he we just became friends and I said, why don't you just trap them and give them to me? Because a friend of mine at the time owned 200 acres on Palomar Mountain, at least to save them. So I released them, but they 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 would just kill them. And you know they would kill some, give some of those animals to the tigers and the lions. That was the other issue. And uh, well, people we, always we go yeah. on all day with this. I I just I just um, want to make that one point though that that there's so much money involved in the AZ, AZPA that uh, uh, and it's so it's like trying to stop Barnum and Bailey. Well, I'm glad you brought that point up because Dan Ash, who is now the president of the AZA, they, they dropped the P. I don't know why. We used to be, uh, you know, American Association of Zoos, Parks and Aquariums. Now it's the American Association and Aquariums or whatever it is. But he was the boss at uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. He's the guy that signed off on the LA moves coming out of Swaziland. He's the actual guy that signed it off against everybody. I know Gay was involved. A lot of other people wrote a letter to stop that move. And they were going to stop that move. And uh, but they went through it. They snuck them out, drugged up at night on a transport plane. And they did it again. And as a reward for that, they made Dan Ash the president of the AZA. So now the guy that was signing off on all the killings, now is in charge of the zoos. Oh, boy. Dan Ash. And I keep telling them the analogy for me was that would be like giving El Chapo in charge of our drug policy in the United States. Yeah. It's huh. the same thing. The money that's involved, and you know, is tremendous amount of money. Oh, it's, I, I don't, I, you know, I just, 
I just wanted to make that comment because I, I worked around that. Schroeder was the director when I was there. Yeah, Schroeder was. Yeah, he started the Wild Animal Park. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know it's, yeah, I, you know, I didn't know the business. Trust me, I have a picture of me standing in front of the Wild Animal Park in 1973 with my friends. I was 18 years old. We driven out to California, don't, and I remember swearing to them, "I'm going to work here one day," <laughs> because you think that you're helping out and you think you're, you know, saving endangered species, not understanding that you're creating more endangered species. Yeah, absolutely, you just are. You're taking them out of the wild instead of bringing them back to the wild. You're taking them out, so you're making, you're contributing to the extinction. Yeah, and uh, and people come and look at them because. It goes back, and you know this. I'm, I'm glad, good to talk to you, but you know this goes back to the great white hunters, and they would bring them over dead, and the people demanded them bring them back alive. So they started circuses, and they started traveling circuses. Yeah. And then, then our arrogance got to us and said, we don't want to wait. We just put up zoos. And they did, and they put up zoos. And when you go through, it's like eliminate – and I was telling a lot of people – Years ago at, at the San Diego Zoo, you may have known this, when they would give their spiel when you go around on their little double decker buses, you know, they give their little tours, they would actually announce that they spent more money on the foliage and the plants than they did on the animals. Yeah, that was a it was all an illusion. You've seen the back, you know what the back bedrooms look like. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes you reevaluate what you've been told. I don't know. I know. And you work, you were at the beginning of this stuff. Well, uh, I, I did meet with Jane Goodall and and Diane Fossey at one time. <laughs> I met. I, I didn't meet her, but I went to a, a speech. Uh, Diane Fossey gave at uh, UC uh, California. She came in, and she was speaking because I was taking care of the Barbary Apes at San Diego State. So I figured I'm just going to go talk. You know, see if I can hear her talk. Boy, was she tough. She was she hard to get along with. She must have been hard to get along. Oh, with. she was. She had a way of doing things, and you either did it her way or you were gone. But I, uh, I'll tell you, <laughs> they would never get away with what. They got away with it. They'd had Diane Fossey in there. I agree. And, I agree. And Jane I agree. Goodall was softer, but she was tough too. I agree. You know? Fossey went. Fossey, I remember her speech. She would come out with no shoes on, and if she didn't like the question you asked, she wouldn't even acknowledge the question. <laughs> she would just keep walking. Anybody got another question? You know, it's like, but you're right. She, when she found out what was going on, there was a quote that she gave to somebody, a friend of mine was working at the zoo at the time uh, doing tours or whatever. I don't think he's on now. He had something going on today. And uh, he remembers Fossey telling whoever was in charge of the primates and the monkeys there, if I was working here, I would kill all of you for what you're doing to these animals. And you know, she meant it because she was pretty yeah. tough. Yeah. And, uh, but it's, I don't, I don't, you know, it just happened just a couple of years ago. It happened at uh, Brookfield. The filtration system went out and they lost like, I don't know, hundred or something stingrays they had a petting stingray area like sea world is with the dolphins they used to have and they all died and you know what the zoo said the next day don't you worry we're gonna go out and get more yeah. it yeah. was never oh, we made a mistake we're so sorry we're not gonna do that again. i'll just go get more yeah. you know look at the george aquarium they have a whale shark there <laughs> at the george aquarium they got oh. big those animals it's just because they have the money to do it. And they think of the money now compared to the money you went through. Oh, compared to, you know. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know either. There, don't, you know what? I have the same answer you do. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. Just, you know, why doesn't somebody sue them? And I, I don't, maybe they're afraid. Maybe they're afraid to do it. I mean, I get, I was asked. I was asked to speak a few years ago, in Chicago, in front of uh, Chicago Law Group. Their section. They have actual sections in Chicago Law area. One is for you know litigation. One is for you know. This was the animal area, and the guy came. You know, we had a long talk with him, and uh, he said, "Well, I want you to come and talk to our group." And I said, "I'll come and talk if I can ask questions to you guys afterwards." And he said, "Nope, that ain't happening." And I said, "I want to know why you aren't suing these guys." And he said, you're not allowed to ask questions of us. We're only allowed to ask questions of you. And those were the lawyers. So whether it's money, whether they get bought off, you know, I do know uh, some people were bought off trying to get into doing documentaries. They just buy up the rights and you never see it again. And uh, maybe that's part of it. I don't know. I mean, look what you, seriously, look what you went through. You're at the beginning stuff. Can imagine, can, I, I don't even want to even go in the place anymore. Well, I know yeah. I worked with Ian Player, 
when he yeah. he was uh, he was a pretty good guy in Africa. Was Schroeder a nice guy? Uh, he was uh, <laughs> he was a power power broker. Yeah. But yeah, I, he was. I always got along with him. He was a veterinarian like I was. Okay. okay. And uh, oh, you know, I I never I couldn't uh, I was I was much younger than he was, and uh, I didn't have any power behind me. I just was a <clears throat> was a veterinarian. I didn't uh, I didn't do any of the policy or any of that sort of thing. Or well, even when I even when I like even when I wrote my little book that I wrote years ago. I sent it out before I, I actually self-published it and it had, you know, it needs some adjustment on it because I, it's long story short, but I went, I sent it out to certain publishers and editors around the country and all of them came back and said, we're not going to take on the Zoological Society. Yeah. They, they just, they, they didn't want to deal with the money, the hassles, the lawsuits. You know what I mean? Even yeah. if they won, it was just the money that had to be put out just to fight the truth. And a friend of mine, who's on right now, she's Britta Wilson. She wrote a book. She worked at the zoo. She was the one that, that would, you know, do the shows down at the Wedgworth Bowl, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, she, she wrote a book and she named everybody and nobody would publish it. They were, just didn't want to take this establishment on. They, you know, it's just, I don't know. I, it's, I don't know. I mean, it'll probably keep going on. You know, this move, this last move with the Ellie's, that was a big one. Then, then you started to see the power that was behind the money and everything else. You know, it's not just the keepers. It's not just the people, you know, working at the stand selling T-shirts. This is big money that's involved in this stuff. And, uh, and it was then, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was then, too. It was then, too. You know, well, Schroeder uh, was the director there then. And, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, Bell Benchley and all that. They, they had a real history. Yeah, I, remember, I, remember, I heard that name before, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but... Um, I worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service too. So did you really? Wow! Well, I, I've seen both sides of it. I, You've seen both sides, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I handling animals. Uh, the inhumanity of humans is horrendous. I know. Under the guise, under the guise of we're helping them. You know, it. It just. I'm amazed that there are. There really are, and it still stuns me after everything. And I listen. I get it from the 50s and 60s and the 70s, let's go, you know, we can go, well, there wasn't the knowledge out there that there is now about sentient beings and them feeling emotions. But there's a group that just doesn't believe you. <laughs> They're going, you're you're just making it up. You're just mad because you aren't working there anymore. And I'm thinking, no, I'm not. I'm not working there because I can't work there. But there's, there's this group out there that will always believe that zoos are in existence to save animals from extinction. They just will. Yeah, they try. No matter what you... Yeah, no matter what you say or I say or anybody says, you and I could sit in front of a forum and say it. And there's going to be enough of that little section that goes, I don't believe you. You know? Yeah. <laughs> they, just, they just will. You know, you met them. Yeah. You met them, you know, and, uh, and they don't want to hear negative stuff. You know, when you're a tourist and you're seriously, and I've mentioned before, you come out of Chicago where it's cold and you go into a tropical area over Florida Canyon, which you know well. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and you see all the palm trees, you don't want to hear negative stuff. You know, you don't want to hear, oh, by the way, this is how they train them. You know, you don't want to hear that. You want to hear and you want to smile and you want to go off to the next move. And uh, they're getting caught now, but they're getting a lot more good at hiding it. You know that. they're getting. Well, I think look, look, look. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think there's a, sort of another indicator you guys might comment on. And that's that some sanctuaries are now partnering with the AZA. I know. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. So I think that is sort of an evidence about the systemic things that you guys are talking about. It's, it's there's more, well, there, there's more there than meets the eye. And it, and I think it comes down to, especially with sanctuaries, which, you know, personally, it's money and it's the flow of money. And when they, somebody comes in with a ton, ton of change and says, you know, you're going to have to open up this sanctuary and let people come by. And you're going to have to. There's already talk now of having a thing at the uh, sanctuary in Tennessee. It's been going on for a couple of years to allow people to go around like they did at the park on a tram. You're not going to go in with them. You're not going to get close, but you're going to be able to look at them. Well, they're partnered and, with AZA now, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And they also uh, support other sanctuaries. 
Uh, and I think what plays into it, which maybe both you can comment on, I know I, I don't mean to take more time because I know other people have questions, but um, I think there's a really powerful thing there, like, you know, like you were talking about, Ray, that, you know, not only do you want to help, you know, you know, are drawn to help, but then there is this, this thing of we want to be close to nature. We want to be close to the animals, which is really positive. But then it has gotten in a very twisted kind of way. So then conservation, sanctuaries, all these things are, how, are very vulnerable. Well, look at Charlie. Look at Charlie. He Charlie didn't work at a zoo. Charlie, well, they're, But they're very vulnerable because they yes. pay and they yeah. then will pay for a lifestyle which has a psychological as well as an economic element to that. No, mm -hmm. Charlie Russell um, was penurious he didn't have any money yeah, he, at all <laughs> you he know? was a rare breed no, but, he could, but he could tell he, but he could but somewhere somewhere along the line maybe we lost that contact where we could talk to the animals or we open up ourselves to hear what they're saying to us you know does that make sense it's like you don't always have to talk to them just sit and listen sometime and they'll let you know the elephants would let us know when they were having a bad day well, i mean I they were just you, you knew you know i think that you know like when, Speakers after you are going to be talking about that in terms of communicators. Um, in fact, one of our next speakers, I think, was on here, P. Horsley, um, about animal communication, quote unquote, in that way. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, Thank you. I'll I'll, the, let it, I'll turn this over to well, Olivia. <laughs> well, you know, that's what Sam taught us. She goes, if you listen, they'll tell you. So, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> well, also they have these game farms like Catskill game farms where they raise Preswalski horses. Yes. No. Uh, the pre of course, the Preswalskis are almost, I don't, I don't know, I think they've been removed from the wild. I don't think yeah, they're, 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 yeah, they're, yeah, they're pretty much only in zoos now. Yeah, they're pretty, and yeah. Preswalskis, so they're ra they are raising some of these animals in game farms, and those game farms will sell them to zoos. Uh, it's a strange, it's a strange sort of set, set up, and I uh, we, we're losing so many species. Yeah. Well, I, I, here's, a, here's a quick side shot, which I didn't want to bring up. But when I first started at the Wild Animal Park, one of the keepers, this is actual true story. This was another wake-up call. He was taking care of the elephants, so he was chosen to go. They found out, I think it was 12 or 13, right off where the elephants were at, they had, which they thought were rare Asiatic lions. They really thought they were. And after genetic testing later on, they found out they were half-breeds. They were half Asian and half African. So one day... You know, Fred Myers, he came up and he goes, I said, where are you going? He goes, I've been chosen to go with taking all the lions and we're taking them to Texas to this farm. And we kept thinking, okay, maybe it's, you know, like Lion Country's Fire, something like that. And he came back and I never saw a look on somebody's face. And I said, what happened? He goes, all of them were shot with bows and arrows before they got out of their cages. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yep. There's, there's, there's at least, I don't know how many, at least 100 game ranches in, in Illinois. There's a ton of them in Texas where you open up a book and you say, by the way, what do you want today? And you would pick out what you want and they would drug the animal and you'd ride up in the Jeep and they'd blow its head off and do whatever they want and stuff it for you. And that's that's what they do. And they get most of their excess animals from places like the Wild Animal Park. Wow. And they only – that's all I tell everybody. You want to find out where the animals – every time you see a billboard sign that says a new baby being born. Here's the new baby. That's when they bring money in. Whether it's on TV, they just we just had stuff that happened at Brookfield. There was a couple of bursts. Go in the next year and say, "Where's that baby at?" And you'll find that it's not there anymore. It's been sold or bought or traded. You know this. You know the, the biz. They all the, they they breed to sell. And there's an actual statement from Amy Wallace, who was a reporter at the LA Times in 1989. She interviewed Kilmar and she interviewed Jim Dolan, and they admitted. They said. We have absolutely no idea where the animals go when they go out the back gate. He goes, we don't track them. We just give them to any of the breeders and traders and dealers. We have no clue. And he would, they were that honest, which scares me they were that honest about it. I would try to hide it, but they were that honest about it. And uh, it still goes on. The baby that was supposed to be born at the Wild Animal Park when I was there from Connie was already bought and given to a guy named Smokey Jones, who is a very famous uh, elephant trainer from the 60s and 70s or whatever. So it's already given to him. It wasn't staying with the baby and the mother in the yard, going out the door to Smokey Jones. And that was just the one thing I saw. So I can imagine on a full scale what it's like. 
you know? Mm-hmm. Well, you saw it, I'm, you know? <laughs> thank you, Ray, for that um, detailed response and all of your insights. And Mike, thank you so much for your for your question. Um, and Gail, so your uh, insightful comments. We are running short on time now. Um, so if anybody has any final questions, uh, they can type those into the chat, uh, into the chat now. But if not, uh, thank you so much, Ray, for being here with us and taking this time with us. It's been such an incredible uh, conversation and everything that you've shared with us is really gives everyone so much to think about and such unique insight into into this whole world. Um, and it was great to meet Mike. Yes, it's absolutely. Great, no, it's great, no, it's always great to meet somebody that worked where you used to work. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Like, it's, it's well, it's, cool inter- it's interesting because you we, we worked with elephants in abnormal situations. Yes, we did. And we were trying to be normal. <laughs> Terrible. I, I know. It was It was great talking to you. I'm honored to have been able to, to talk. talk with you. Yeah, and Mike great. will be a guest on a Further Living One series, which we're very excited for. So great. if you guys want to hear more conversation with oh, him, we will. absolutely come back. Um, but we'll really gross you out next time. <laughs> what was that? We'll really gross you out next time. <laughs> <laughs> Our next speaker uh, in this series will be a week from today on Friday, March 3rd at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And we will be joined by Zohara Hieronymus, an award-winning radio broadcaster, author, social justice, environmental, and animal activist, who will be joining us to discuss transspecies telepathy and ecosystem meditation, bringing together heart and mind. Um, So once again, thank you everybody for joining us for your questions, Ray, for sharing your time and, and insights with us. We really appreciate everyone being here and we look forward to seeing you next week. Anything for a fellow Chicagoan. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) Great to see you all. (laughs) Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Ray. Bye-bye. Bye.